This is the new Apple Watch Series 9, which includes a number of new improvements internally, as well as software enhancements that take advantage of that new hardware. This is also Siri, like apparently transcribing my entire thing right now for no particularly good reason. Nonetheless, we will continue on this review, testing this over the last little while, putting it through its paces, swimming, cycling, and running to see how well this watch performs and apparently how well Siri transcribes things. In any case, the price is $399, the same as it's been in the past. That's for the base model, the cellular models a little bit more. Starting first off with those hardware changes. Uh, the very first thing to note is that they've increased the brightness of the display, doubled it in fact from 1000 nits up to 2000 nits. Now nits is simply a measure of brightness, of screen brightness in this particular case, whether it be your iPhone screen or a watch screen or a TV screen, uh, the more nits you have, the brighter something can be. If I take an Apple Watch Series 8 to the left there, you can see these two side by side, here we go. And it's honestly probably gonna be hard to notice this in this particular setting. Where you can see it a little bit better is the flashlight function. So if I go down to that right there and go to full brightness on both of them, here's where you can start to see that this one on the right is brighter. Again, it's really hard to see in this scenario. The best example I've seen is actually a shot I took outside today that shows the two side by side in kind of like broken cloud conditions, where you can see it's a slight bit brighter on the Series 9 than the Series 8. Generally speaking, I wouldn't overthink this though. A thousand nits is really bright, whether you're on a beach or on the top of a mountain in the middle of summer, uh, it's still quite bright uh, once you've, you know, raise your wrist and kind of goes to full brightness. What is honestly pretty useful though is actually the flashlight of all things uh, to be able to see what's going on around you at a much you know, brighter level than in the past. Now in addition, Apple's also reduced the minimum floor threshold of nits from two nits down to one nit, which are doing primarily at night when it's in always on mode on your wrist while you're sleeping uh, so that they can save that battery and apply it towards other things. Other things in this case would be the new S9 chipset. That chipset has a bunch of new technical advancements that you can see on the screen right there. Most of that is just technical stuff. It doesn't really mean anything to you. If I take these two watches side by side and go through the menus, you'll see they respond in almost identical ways. Tap open the workouts, scroll through this. There's really no, again, there's no difference to this like a daily usability standpoint. This is all about leveraging that additional processing power uh, for other things. And one of those other things is double tap. A double tap is a feature that allows you to go ahead and raise your wrist like this, double tap your fingers to iterate through the menus. So if I do this right here, you can see I'm double tapping my fingers and I'm iterating through the widgets on my dashboard, uh, just like that. You can also go ahead and use double tap to answer a phone call. Someone starts calling, I use double tap, boom, it answers the call. I get sick of them, boom, double tap and they go away. I wanna take a photo using the camera app on my watch on the phone to trigger it, boom, double tap and picture happens. Now, a lot of you have said, isn't that the same feature that's been available for years in accessibility under quick actions and assistive touch? Uh, the answer to that is kind of, sort of, not really. Uh, so there is definitely overlap there. Clearly there's overlap, the, the gestures are in many ways the same. But in having used the assistive touch feature for the last week or so, I can tell you that basically the starting point, double tap actually works versus the assistive touch feature doesn't work super well. And I get that there are some people that have mastered the nuance of making that work well for them. Uh, but if you just go to Reddit and look, you'll find for most people, it's generally speaking a dumpster fire. Uh, and that's because they're kind of doing different things. In the case of assisted touch, it's mostly a menu item that pops up that you can confirm or deny using those gestures. Versus this is running 24 by seven behind the scenes and is always ready to double tap and trigger something. Now, could Apple introduce double tap into older watches without the S9 chipset? My guess is probably Apple has the power to do most things, uh, but whether or not they could do that without sacrificing battery life or other features is something that really only Apple knows. And now a quick note, if you are finding this video interesting and useful, now's a great time to whack that like button at the bottom or subscribe, it really does help with this video and the channel quite a bit. Now the next area that Apple says they're using that offline processor for is Siri. Uh, there's two different areas. Number one is offline access to Siri. Uh, so if you don't have cellular connectivity, Siri will now work for hyper limited scenarios. Like basically setting timers and and like a reminder, that's really about it actually, just like setting timers pretty much. Uh, I tried it today, I was at the swim dock, didn't have my phone with me, so no cellular connectivity because it's not a cellular edition. Uh, and my wife wanted to know how many yards 3,800 meters was. And we asked, and Siri was like, no. You're on your own for that, buddy. Uh, it said it needed connectivity for that particular question, which I would have thought like that's a relatively basic question to ask, uh, and it, it couldn't do that. Uh, still, the second feature is more cool, but it's not coming until later on this year, which is the ability to ask Siri questions from Apple Health. Uh, so you can pull in things like, what was my sleep last night? Or you can tell it to record your weight from a scale and all that kind of stuff. There's a whole bunch of different questions you can ask it. Uh, that'll be available in English and Mandarin, but again, not till sometime later on this year. The last area that's new from a hardware perspective is the addition of the new Gen 2 Ultra Wideband chipset. 
That allows you to do Find My from the wrist to other things within a close proximity. Uh, so it's essentially the same as if you had your phone, you were trying to find an AirTag. You can kind of walk around now and you'll see exactly where it is, the direction, how far it is to that particular device. In the past when you did that, it would just basically tell your device to start chirping uh, versus now you can actually see exactly where it is and kind of go from there. Now is a good time to dive into a number of the activity and fitness and health tracking features. I'm gonna start with the basics and kind of step my way down pretty quickly into some of the more advanced new features on the watch. The first thing is activity tracking hasn't really changed from the past. Uh, you still have the Apple rings. You can see the rings right there. I can tap into that. I can see my different goals for the day. So if I go to the very top, I'm sorry, this way, um, you can see those are the rings that you try to close each day. Uh, and you close them by completing different things. So for example, my move goal for the day, uh, 900, I got 1,598 calories. My exercise goal, about two hours on 30 minutes of uh, my goal. My stand goal and so on. Uh, and you can see how many steps I have there. Uh, as well as the workouts I did, a swim and then a, a run as well. All of that remains the same as in the past. You can open up your phone and uh, look at all the stats there as well. You can challenge friends, you can earn badges. Likewise, sleep tracking is also the same as well. Uh, so now it's in sleep mode and we're gonna unlock this here. Uh, go into sleep mode and I can see my sleep stats for last night by tapping the little bed. Uh, and you can see, for example, my sleep stages right there. I can go down, I can see the time I was asleep, five hours, 58 minutes go down again, uh, and you can see my trending over the last little while. From an accuracy standpoint, I found the time that I went to bed and woke up uh, spot on, the duration of sleep was spot on. The one quirk was the time in bed metric, which is viewable on the app, uh, was like way, like many, many hours earlier than I went to bed. Uh, like at one point I was still in the shower and then making dinner and then watching TV, and it, still, uh, it said I was in bed the entire time, which wasn't quite right. But the part I care about, which is the duration, is correct, and so I was good with that. Uh, when it comes to those sleep stages and sleep phases, uh, I don't tend to look at that data uh, because the gold standard to measure that against isn't super gold, it's more like bronzish. It's only about 80% accurate, so I don't generally judge things based on 80% accuracy rate, it just seems weird to me. Versus for heart rate and GPS, our accuracy level is far, far higher to work with. Now it's worth noting that the Apple Watch Series 9, like the Apple Watch Series 8 before, will do wrist temperature tracking at night automatically. Uh, that's primarily used for looking back historically uh, at female ovulation cycle data. So it'll basically do kind of prediction of what your data was in the past. It won't do it forward looking for you yet, but it tells you what happened in the past. And it requires you to wear that each night and it requires five days of baselining data. Uh, and that's on a given watch. So for some reason you win from the Series 8 to the Series 9, no reason to do that. But if you did, then restart that five-day baselining process. Now transitioning to sports a little bit. One thing to note is that this is the Nike uh, watch face there, along with the Nike band. There is no dedicated Nike Apple Watch edition anymore. It's basically you can get Nike bands and you know you can use the Nike apps and whatnot on the watch, but uh, it's not a dedicated watch itself. Opening things up though, I can go into the workout app as you see right there, and I can choose the workout or sport profile that I want. Uh, so if I then tap the dot, dot, dot in the upper right-hand corner, these are suggested workouts that it wants me to do. Um, and I can go down here and do an open workout or all these purple ones are custom workouts that I've personally created. So I can create my own interval workouts on this. Um, and I can also customize the data pages. So if I go to the very, very bottom there, preferences, outdoor run views, I can swipe down and change all the preferences there. Once I'm out in my run, I will see those data pages that I configured. And this is true of really any sport on the Apple Watch. Uh, and then at the end of the run, I'll see all my data, uh, both on the watch as a very brief summary there with much more data in the Apple Fitness app. So let's start diving into some of the newer software features uh, that are on watchOS 10, including on the Apple Watch Series 9. The first one is new topographic maps or contour maps that leverages your phone. You do have to have your phone with you, uh, but your phone can download those maps ahead of time offline. Uh, those maps are only available for the US and as of right now, really only available in California and like things within about an hour or two drive from California. Apple initially hoped to have all that ready to go by now in September, but they're behind and they pushed that timeline out. By the end of the year, Apple says it'll be available in most places in the US. Uh, also, I asked what the definition of most was, because right now in California, uh, California is really only in like a handful of like national park sort of lands, but not just anywhere uh, like a normal topographic map would be. Uh, they said by the time we get to the end of the year, it should be more closer to the anywhere realm of most uh, than just a handful of parks. So again, that's still just in the US, but I guess it's a starting point from that. There. So well, that's a start, the area they've clearly spent a lot more time on has to do with cycling. Uh, the first area is essentially a screen mirroring from your watch to your phone, or a companion app, if you will, uh, that allows you to see all of your watch data fields blown up big screen style on your phone. You can then mount your phone to your handlebars if you're outside or just put it somewhere else if you're inside uh, on a indoor spin bike or an indoor trainer of some sort. Uh, and you see all those same metrics, including your heart rate, your power, and so on. I think for most cyclists, they're probably gonna have a dedicated bike computer today where this is more 
useful is probably that commuting realm uh, where you just have your phone, your handlebars, and maybe your watch is underneath your jackets and stuff like that in the winter, and you can just see those metrics right there. Instead, for more hardcore cyclists, there's the addition of cycling sensor support. This adds in power meter support uh, via Bluetooth, as well as cycling speed and cadence sensor support. You can pair up power meters, as I've done over the last, uh, basically the entire summer, in fact, with WatchOS 10, but also here in the Apple Watch Series 9 as well. You'll pair your power meter on the Bluetooth menu, and then back in your data display pages on the cycling profiles, you want to enable the power meter profile there, as well as also enable the cycling power zones there. Uh, you can configure custom zones if you want to using your phone, uh, or you can do FTP detection, which will go ahead and automatically try to detect and figure out your FTP or your functional threshold power uh, after a number of rides. In my testing, that FTP piece is the only part that didn't work super well. The, the power meter side worked great, the uh, zones worked great, but the FTP side just hasn't worked for me really all summer. Like it sporadically detects stuff every once in a while, and then when it does, it's super low compared to my actual FTP values. And still, it is super cool to have power meter support on an Apple Watch natively. Up until now, there was no like good solution for that. There was a handful of apps that did it like barely, but it, there was just a lot of caveats to that. Uh, now it just, the just works factor is super high here, which is really cool. And we're seeing third party apps like Trainer Road, it's just really popular in the cycling community, already taking advantage of that and being able to push structure workouts using power to your watch and having you do those workouts outside uh, just already on launch day, which is, which is awesome to see. So once you've got all that stuff sorted, what's the battery life look like? Uh, well, essentially Apple maintains the same 18 hour all day battery life they've had for years, uh, or double that if you turn on the low power mode. What low power mode does is simply turn off the always on display. So it's only gesture based. So you raise your wrist, you see the display, put it down, the display turns off. Just like it's off right now on the table because it's not on my wrist and, and not raised. In my testing using the always on mode, which is what I prefer and what's the default, uh, I would say that 18 hours is conservative, but about right, like it's under a little bit. Uh, I've been getting basically once a day charging, including roughly 60 to 90 minutes of workouts per day. So the same like normal charge your Apple Watch once a day sort of thing. So with all that said, what about accuracy of the heart rate and GPS? For that, we'll jump over to the computer. So starting off on the GPS side of things, this run here along the beach in Los Angeles, Santa Monica, should be fairly straightforward. And indeed the accuracy is spot on here uh, from both the Series 9 as well as the Ultra. So no problems there. Then it's out to an outdoor ride. This was mostly in open conditions, though dumping the entire time. Uh, but there was one section that went through some wooded areas and that's really the only time I saw a little bit of difference between the units, but it was all very, very minor. Then it's into a city test. This is one of the hardest tests I do, basically mimicking running in a city like in Manhattan or something like that. You can see this right here, tall buildings, about 20, 30 stories tall. Uh, and things did not go well here, either for the Ultra or the Series 9. The Series 9 in green, they're really just all over the place, which is rather strange. I haven't seen like this bad a performance in quite a while. Now, in talking to Apple, they had a couple ideas why that might be the case for moving to a new location. Uh, nonetheless, I went back out again the next day. I switched wrists for the watches just for fun, uh, though I actually switched the size of street midway through each test on purpose for just that reason. Uh, and things were definitely better. Still not like amazing, but way, way, way better than before uh, and more in line with what I would expect from the Apple Watch Series 9. So they're going back out and looking at an open water swim or doing an open water swim and looking at that, uh, you can see that the tracks are spot on. So no problems there at all. Switching over to the heart rate side of things, this is the run, uh, kind of relatively steady state run. It was spot on with the chest strap and other devices. Uh, here, this is the outside ride, a very difficult thing for most optical sensors on the wrist, yet it did pretty well. A couple of minor bobbles, but that's to be expected on the wrist. Uh, and then here is a bit of like an interval run of sorts, or every once in a while I did some sprints along the way. Uh, and this, again, tracked it without any issues at all. So overall, pretty good. Okay, so where do we stand overall? Well, this is a modest upgrade, which is honestly generally the case every year. I think people look at the Apple Watch lineup and think every year it's going to be something amazingly big between each edition. And maybe that'll be the case next year with the so-called Apple Watch X, you know, the 10th anniversary Apple Watch. Uh, and certainly we saw that last year with the Apple Watch Ultra being a second lineup. But Apple's thing in life is to have small incremental updates each year for the Apple Watch. And this is exactly what they did this year as well. Uh, they incremented the display brightness quite a bit, in fact. Uh, they incremented the processor behind it quite a bit, in fact. Uh, and otherwise, it's essentially the same Apple Watch you know and love. The same bands, the same size of screen, all the kind of same stuff, the same price. Uh, it's designed not to appeal to people going from a Series 8 to a Series 9, but to appeal to people that may have something like an Apple Watch Series 4, 5, 6, or even a 7 uh, to maybe make the jump up to the Series nine instead. And in that case, they've achieved that. In the course on the software side of things, we've seen a pretty strong update this year as well as last year for sports and fitness, a trend that I suspect will continue into next year as well. 
Anyways, if you found this review interesting or useful, definitely whack that like button at the bottom there or subscribe for plenty more sports technology goodness. With that, have a good one. This is really impressive, by the way. I'm just, I'm actually kind of like, just, I just want to watch how far it's going to go. It hasn't stopped. I've been like reshooting this and it keeps on going and going and going. Though it's actually quite a bit further behind.